guys, it's Nurse Jet, Nursing the Truth. I hope everyone's having a great Thursday. Well, me, I'm on my third video of today with trying to do some things around the house, taking kids here and there, and still having time for you guys. That is exactly what I live for daily, is truth. Truth to myself, truth to who I am, and always nursing the truth. Now, what am I going to talk about now? Well, let's see. Moses and monotheism. And Akhenaten, the heretic king. So, you say, Nurse J, why are you on this kick of trying to expose these biblical players? Because, truth seekers, once you understand the historicity historicity of things, I'm tongue-tied, then you can understand when you read the Bible who and what are is going on. So, Moses and Monotheism was written by Sigmund Freud shortly before he died. He was also, quote, a Jewish person um, and knew that there was something wrong, that this wasn't the real story. Mustafa Gadala was also another author that wrote about it. And in this book, Akhenaten, The Heretic King, written by Donald Redford. And yes, dear true seekers, I have read all of these books. And will continue to flip back and forth to give you information. Now, Akhenaten is your biblical player for your Moses character. So, if Jesus comes out of the lineage of David through all of this menagerie, then that can't be. So, sorry, it ends there, guys. It ends there. Um, Tut Moses III was your biblical David. Your um, Amhotef III is your Solomon. Now, an Akhenaten is going to be your Moses character. Before anyone in history... History, any country, any leader, any priesthood. Akhenaten was the very first person, a ruler, to ever quit the polytheistic gods. Not to say that he didn't care about them. He just wanted that one particular god to be over everything. But the sad thing about it is is the Egyptians already knew that there was one prime force, that you could not see this force, but this force was in each one of us and the animals and the plants and everything. So he, I think he was messed up. That's just my personal opinion. Now, he did have some beautiful poems, which is in Psalms 104. Um, but... <clears throat> He had a vendetta against the Amun priesthood. Um, and basically, all of this issue was about politics and religion. Okay? They were one and the same. So, he ruled for, for a while with his father. And his father um, had been ill. And... Sigmund Freud, like I said, he was the Jewish father psychoanalyst, and he was interested about Akhenaten and Moses, and he wrote a book about it. He said that Freud's conclusion was that Moses was an Egyptian name. Um, and he said also, too, that um, if Moses was an Egyptian he said, between the new religion that Akhenaten had tried to impose on his country and the religious teaching ascribed to Moses, Sigmund Freud Roy wrote, the Jewish creed says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. The Hebrew letter D is equivalent to the Egyptian letter T, and the Hebrew E becomes the Egyptian O. 
Therefore, the sentence from the Jewish creed can be translated, Hear, O Israel, our God, Aten is the only God. Akhenaten stated and he declared that Aten is the only God. And Aten is the same as a tomb, Amen, Amen Ra, Ra, Ra Harakuti, Ra Haru. So, don't play with me, guys. I know my sun deities. So, um, that's basically the deal. He wanted this one particular son, God's name, and he wanted to change some things, just like the Protestants broke off from Catholicism, but still kept some of the Catholicism, you know, doctrines in some form and turned it around and then had their heyday with it. So, anyway... Now, his childhood, Akhenaten's father, Amhotep III, named after Amun, he fell in love with Yuya's daughter, T. Now, your Yuya character, the real life person, is going to be Joseph in the Bible. And it all makes sense once you start breaking it down. So, Joseph, Yuya's daughter, T, or Ty, however you want to say it, in order to inherit the throne, Amhotep III married his sister, Sitamun. But shortly after he married his sister, Sitamun, he married Tai. She was not full-blooded Egyptian, Tai wasn't. Um, so, therefore, he made, instead of making Sitamun the great royal queen wife, he made Tai, you see. Because Joseph, quote, Yuya was his vizier second in charge. And if you read the Bible, he made Joseph second in all the land. And he had vast amounts of land. Second in charge. Father to the Pharaoh. See, but people don't want to read the book. And they don't want to put pieces together. So, Amenhotep III's marital actions were irresponsible and must have created a poisonous atmosphere. Later, T had a son, Tuthmosis, who was educated and trained at Memphis and who held the title of High Priest of Ptah, as did most apparent during the 18th Dynasty. But he disappeared from the scene. There may have been an imminent danger waiting Tai's sons. She was a mixed Egyptian and had Israelite or slash Aparu or Hebrew blood. Now the story is making sense, isn't it? And if her son succeeded the throne, this would be regarded as forming a new dynasty of non-Egyptian part Aparu, Hebrew, Israelites over Egypt. Now, her second son born in 1394 BCE, and the fortified frontier city of Zar, Z-A-R-W, it was Amhotep IV, later known as Akhenaten. What's funny is the city of Zar, Z-A-R-W, was in the land of Goshen, people. But, as you know, Egypt, that was just a suburb that, that was in the land of Egypt. And they always had eyes on their land, people. So you can't leave Egypt to go to Egypt. You're already in Egypt. So, now upon Akhenaten's birth, T sent him by water to the safety of her uh, relatives at nearby Goshen. This event is echoed in the biblical story of Moses being found by a princess in the bulrushes by the bank of the Nile. Now, Sargon, King Sargon, was also in the bulrushes. So, it could be a copied story, yada yada, who gives a crap? I'm just giving you the information. Now, another thing is that 
I cannot spit most of his youth in the Eastern Delta and at Heliopolis. In the Eastern Delta, where he was influenced by Aten, a god without an image, and you have to understand that the Nile Delta is all the way to the top, the east. If you look at the, uh, Egypt now on a map, it's east of Egypt, okay? And that's the Delta. So that is where these particular people were at, and they were um, worshiping Aten. But at Heliopolis, it was the priest of Ra. And so um, there's no evidence that Akhenaten spent his early days at Memphis at all. There's been no um, carvings, no um, reliefs or anything of him. Uh, any, anything with his father, there was nothing was, was carried over. Um, in his early teenage life, Akhenaten was able to go to um, the resident at Thebes with his father. And the priests of Amun and the nobles of Egypt, the protectors of old tradition, regarded Akhenaten with contempt for his mixed race. See, they didn't like him because he was mixed. And isn't it funny in the scriptures it says that they didn't want to mix with other people? Hmm. Ding, ding, ding. Egyptians. So, it was not he who first rejected them. It was they, the Almond priesthood, who refused to accept him as a legitimate heir to the throne. So, when his father's health began to deteriorate, T's power increased correspondingly. In order to ensure her son's inheritance to the throne, she arranged for him to marry his sister, Nefertiti, his half-sister, Nefertiti. It could be whole or half. Now, the story gets even more stickier because I, which was the vizier during Tut's I mean, uh, reign, they say that Nefertiti was the child of I, so here again, people, we have mixed blood, not full Egyptian. So she was, um, she was the daughter of Amenhotep III by his sister Sitnamun. This is what it says in this particular book. But another author says this could be I's um, daughter. Now, in the Bible, Nefertiti is the Miriam of the story. Moses' sister. Yeah, because see, you know, Egyptians married and kept the royal bloodline going, just like the queen of today married second and third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh cousins, just to keep the bloodline going, pure bloodline. And that's what the Egyptians wanted was a pure blood, no, nothing going on. So, that's something interesting for you to know. Now, Once Akhenaten was no longer on the throne, use of his royal names were forbidden. He was referred officially in later times as the falling one of Akhenaten and the rebel of Akhenaten in the Amarna tablets. The Aten worship, there were very many Neturu in Egypt and some deities had only local distinctions. But Aten did also appear in a few texts of the 12th dynasty, and it appeared frequently since the time of Tutmosis IV. Akhenaten exalted Aten over above the others, and Aten is the disk of the sun as physical manifestation of Ra. Aten had no image unlike the other Neteru. Adonai in Hebrew means my Lord. The last two letters, A-I, of the word is a Hebrew pronoun meaning my or mine, and significantly possession of Adonai, meaning Lord. Adon is the Hebrew equivalent of the Egyptian Aten. He does write a hymn to the Aten that says, the cattle are content in their pasture, the trees and plants and green, the birds fly from their nest, their wings are raised in praise of your soul, 
The goats leap on their feet. All flying and fluttering things live when you shine on them. Likewise, the boats race up and down the river, and every way is open because you have appeared. The fish in the river leap before your face, and your rays go to the depth of the sea. And that is in Psalms 104. So, if you're thinking about reading this book, and it's t and you're thinking that it's this God, this man on a throne with a white beard, and he's got a book and a pen and all, watching you, you understand, you already know that it's talking about the sun, sun worship. So, Akhenaten chose the solar form of the Egyptian temple to be used as a place for worship of the Aten in the helio, um, heliopolitan solar form. <clears throat> Likewise, Moses was the first person to introduce a temple into Israelite worship when he created the tabernacle in Sinai. Akhenaten adopted the Egyptian practice of a holy boat which was usually kept in the temple. The ark was used to carry the deity during processions. Moses also introduced the ark where the Pentateuch scrolls were kept, and the ark is respected as the second holiest part of the Jewish temple after the Pentateuch itself. Rituals and worship of the newly established Israelite priesthood were similar to those introduced by Akhenaten. Across the Nile from Tel El Marna, there is a city of Malawi, or Melevi, which literally means the city of the Levites. The Levites, who held priestly positions with Moses, held the same positions with Akhenaten at El Marna, such as Mary Ra II was the high priest of Aten at the Amarna Temple. The Hebrew equivalent of this name is Mary, M-E-R-A-R-I, who was described in Genesis 46, 11, as one of the sons of Levi. So you better get off your duff and quit watching stupid TV. And you better start getting in these books and you better start peeling them away one layer at a time, like an onion. Because people, when you unleash the beast, then you will find that you have been hoodwinked from hell. And there's not one. But as I digress, I will expose. And my favorite one of the day, which I did a video on this, Pan Nahesi, as your Phineas. And it says, was the chief servitor of the Aten at Akhenaten's temple. The Hebrew equivalent of this name is Phineas, who was the son of Eleazar and the grandson of Aaron, according to Exodus 6.25. And I made a video on that about two weeks ago. And I broke it down. And when I did, the dirt was coming through, people. And it said, Pan Nahasi, an Egyptian Negro. Now, let me tell you something. Are you going to believe what that book says? Or are you going to believe historical information? It is therefore evident that Mustafa Gadala says, we are dealing with the same high officials who served Akhenaten at Amarna and then accompanying him to Sinai afterwards. Yet another confirmation that Moses and Akhenaten are one of the same. Yes, they are. <laughs> they are the same. So these players, his fictional characters, David, there's none. Solomon, there's none. Hmm? How can Jesus come from the house of David when there's not one? Hmm? There go 
Broncos, your chance to go to heaven. Akhenaten's almost 18-year reign was mostly a co-regency with his father. He reigned for first 12 years with his father, and it was probably that the last few years of his reign was a co-regency with Simkare. told you about I. After Akhenaten quote-unquote left, I was the vizier and Tut became pharaoh. But because Tut was still a little boy, basically I was overseeing everything until Tut became a little older. So, in his 17th year, Akhenaten suddenly disappeared. At and about the same time, Simkare died. The co-regency of Akhenaten and Simkare was succeeded by Tutankhamun. Now, Akhenaten may have been warned by I of the threat on his life. Because, see, the Amun priesthood were coming for Akhenaten at Akhenaten City, which is Tel Almarna. He abdicated to flee to the Sinai Peninsula with a small group of followers, taking with him the symbol of pharaonic authority, a staff top with a brass serpent. Now, although Sinai was part of Egypt from the early days of Egyptian history, there was no governing authority there, even though it was Egypt's. It was more or less a buffer zone between Egypt and its neighbors. Now, <clears throat> just kind of giving you the backdrop. Akhenaten also had a vizier named Aper El, and um, he was discovered intact in Saqqara. Now, Aper El consists of two parts. The first part, Aper, corresponds to the word for Hebrew, and El is for Elohim, which means the Lord in Hebrew. In fact, Akhenaten's vizier was a worshiper of El, confirms the strong bond between the king and the Israelites living in Egypt at the time. Such a bond is also evident in many pieces of funerary items which were found in Aper El's tomb. They included a box given to Aper El by Amenhotep III and Queen T, as well as Amenhotep's third cartouche. Israelites, Aparu, Hebrew, wandering nomads. So, the house of his high priest, Panahesi Phineas, in your Bible, was located prominently in the city. He was never buried in his assigned tomb, and I believe his assigned tomb is number six. He is equated to the biblical Phineas, the priest, who, according to the Talmud, killed Jesus. Ooh, that's the new twist to the story, but I already know the story. The main themes in all the tombs repeat themselves. At the entrance, there is always a hymn to the Aten Dis. No evidence of burial or even sarcophagi have been found in any of the nobles' tombs.
so. In the exile, it says that according to the Talmud, now I don't have access to the Talmud. I don't know how to get this. But it says, according to the Talmud, when Moses was 18, he fled Egypt after killing an Egyptian. He became a soldier and fought on the side of the king of Ethiopia against a rebellion led by an Egyptian native, native Balaam. After the king won, Moses became very popular. As a result, when the king died, Moses was appointed as their new king, and they gave him the widow of their king for a wife. Moses reigned in justice and righteousness, but the queen of Ethiopia, Adonaiath, wanted her own son by the dead king to rule. She said to the people, why should this stranger continue to rule over you? The Talmud account goes that even though the people loved and wanted him, Moses resigned voluntarily and departed from their land. The people of Ethiopia bestowed great honors upon him. Moses was elevated to the post of king for some time before going to Sinai, Akhenaten likewise. Moses officiated as the high priest, Akhenaten as well. The Talmud reference to Ethiopia, which is described as being a city, was mistaken for the Amarna location. The name of the Egyptian queen who became the wife of Moses is given as Adonaiath, which means Aten it. Her name is clearly derived from the Aten, who was Akhenaten's god. The queen's desire to place her son on the throne instead of Moses is similar to King Tut respecting his father, Akhenaten. You know, looking at this book, um, sorry, I cannot inherit a king. It says that Amenhotep III married at least two Babylonian princesses. The brother of one, Kadashman Enlil, shows himself in his letters to be an old fellow, a complainer, an, an haggler. Some of his complaining may not have been without cause. Amenhotep III neglect on one occasion to send a message of condolence when Kadash Man Enlil was ill. And on another delayed answer, le another delayed answering a letter for six years. You know, it's funny because we have now in this letter the reason why I wanted to tell you about this man's name, Kadeshman Enlil, a Babylonian person. People don't believe in the Anunnaki. People name their children of ancestry or bloodlines. So this person through Babylon, Iraq, was named after the god, Anunnaki god in Lil. So I thought you would get a kick out of that today. So anyway, there's mixtures of the bloodlines with the Egyptian people through Amhotep III as well. And T and I and Nefertiti. So there's lots of mixtures for the Syrian, the Canaanites, the Aparu, the Hebrew, the Israelites, whatever you want to call them. There's so many. So anyway, until next time, I hope you've enjoyed this enlightening video of Akhenaten, the heretic king, the Moses of your Bible, the Tut Moses as your David, your Amahotep the third as your Solomon, your Miriam as Nefertiti, your Penahasi as your Phineas. So there again, how can you get the bloodline of David?
for your redeemer of your sins when there was not a historical David. Until then, Hotep and Ashe, and we will see you soon, my friends. Have a wonderful evening.